Before the shadow of World War I fell across the nation, William Henry Corkill, a farm manager from Tilba, took up a sudden passion for photography. Capturing the social life of the Tilba Tilba region on thousands of glass plate negatives from 1890 to 1910, the 840 plates that remain offer a rich and unique time capsule of life in regional Australia prior to the Great War. Also suspended in time upon these fragile plates of glass are images of Corkill's middle child, Elizabeth Pearl Corkill. Born and raised at Marengo in Tilba Tilba, Pearl was a trailblazer in her own right. After hearing news of the tumultuous losses suffered at Gallipoli, she enrolled with the Australian Army Nursing Service as Sister Pearl Corkill, 1915. Aged 28, she departed for Egypt on board the MV Kalura with her camera and 50 other nurses. Sister Pearl Corkill was unknowingly to become what journalist Peter Rees has described as one of the other Anzacs. She would also become a recipient of the highest military award for bravery, the Military Medal. Pearl's photographs and letters home and a collection of souvenirs cast light onto several of the most fascinating historical recesses of World War I, which despite recent efforts, still constitute missing chapters within the Anzac story. The rising popularity of photography during World War I and Pearl's self-reliance and her prudence with resources have worked in history's favour. Pearl Corkill's great-niece, Gay Lane, spent early childhood years visiting. I can't even remember her talking about, talking about the war at all, yeah. And as I said, when we went to her house and went into her bedroom, she had a little sitting room off her bedroom and there was quite a bit of uh, memorabilia around the place and some of that is um, here. But I also remember seeing a grenade <laughs> and I often wonder now whether, whether it was uh, disarmed or not, but what happened to it, I don't know, but I can remember seeing that. You know, it was quite, as a young, well, well I suppose I was probably, uh, probably about 16 or something, I uh, wondered if it was okay. I never touched it because <laughs> we knew not to, not to touch anything. <laughs> yeah, so you could look but you didn't touch it. Yeah, we, we'd never asked too many questions and also she didn't divulge much about her life during the war. And it's only in later years that we've been able to find out from historians. But we feel very proud now that we know more about her. We used to kind of laugh a bit, I suppose, because she had um, she used to wear her old uniforms around the house. Maybe they were just the house clothes, um, but they'd be all stitched up. And we, we used to think that was a little bit funny. But in today's world, that's a good thing that she was using recycling things and. Um, also, we used to joke that, uh, and I know that happens sometimes, that the Christmas cards you'd get from her, um, they'd have the middle. In those days, the Christmas cards used to have an insert in the middle, and the, you could see the insert had been there, but it had been taken out, and then the Christmas card would be written on <laughs> on the um, original one again. So, <laughs> but she was she was the uh, the real recycler, which was a good thing because she kept things. So now we've got some of this um, memorabilia and and um, history, which we feel very proud now. Mm -hmm. Cousins around the place, and um, there was a cousin at Foster, Pearl's cousin, who got some letters uh, that Pearl had written back to her mother during the war, and she actually published them as a private um, book for the family, so that's quite precious now too, because you can follow history through of what Pearl was um, doing during the First World War. So it's good, and it's good that Aunty Pearl, I guess, was a a recycler or a hoarder that she kept a lot of these things whereas nowadays we throw out um, something breaks and we throw it out whereas in the times gone past that uh, things would be fixed and reworn or whatever. 
Sister Corkill was one of over 2,000 nurses who volunteered for overseas service with the Australian Army Nursing Service and enrolled with the AIF, the Australian Imperial Force. Sadly, 25 of these AANS nurses would lose their lives in active service. Others, with the Red Cross and Bluebirds, or attached to other overseas nursing services, would also lose their lives. Crossing the equator and arriving into the heat and dust of Cairo, Pearl would not return home for almost four years. She had crossed over into an unimaginable world where Australia would suffer over 60,000 fatalities and where 156,000 men would be wounded, gassed or taken prisoner. She had arrived into a conflict that would claim 10 million lives on all sides. What Pearl discovered and photographed when she arrived in Egypt, seems surreal from today's vantage point. Her first hospital post could quite well have been taken for a mirage. A letter home to her mother brings to life the opulence of the first Australian General Hospital at the Heliopolis Palace Hotel. The palace is a most beautiful place, so huge. There must be a hundred rooms. Each one was furnished with priceless treasures. My love to you all, Pearl. Here's Catherine McCullough, editor and compiler of Willingly Into the Fray, on what conditions were like. The, the hospitals were um, not particularly well set up. The, the big um, hospital at Heliopolis was in an old palace. Um, and that was a big area, but not particularly sensible, so the rooms were not well laid out in terms of where they could put patients. Um, other hospitals were at Mina House, which was um, much smaller, and there was also at Gezira Palace, there was another hospital there. Once again, beautiful palace, but not particularly suited to, um, to a hospital. They also established a hospital later on at Luna Park. Uh, so there are, they had to adapt, and this is what Australian nurses were terribly good at, adapting and making do with what they had. Whilst Pearl's letters home reveal a desire to spare her mother from worry, in later age, in a newspaper interview, Pearl spoke more freely. And about why many of the worst casualties had been sent home before Pearl's arrival. They simply knew, she said, that the big wounds wouldn't heal in Egypt. The heat and the climate was against them. The impact on casualty rates of pioneering 20th century military technologies, the development of machine guns, artillery, tanks, flamethrowers, mines, air attacks and chlorine and mustard gas, and the disastrous reliance on 19th century battle strategies in this, the world's first mechanised war, had not yet been comprehended. The prevailing view amongst AIF army chiefs was that women and nurses had no place at the front line. The Australian Army Nursing Service, to which Pearl belonged and to which her own personal story is indelibly linked, was but a young, fledgling nursing service. But it was one born out of the Boer War, where Australian nursing sisters, like matron Nellie Gould, had proved their mettle with grit and distinguished service. Yet most of the AIF army chiefs had begun the war regarding nurses as little more than first aiders, as supervisors for orderlies. Stratified attitudes towards women's roles tell us much about Sister Corkill's own irrepressible spirit and the perseverance and endurance of Australian nurses per se. Women had only just won the right to vote in 1902. The Australian Army vigorously rejected all offers from women doctors to enlist throughout the Great War. Women were said to be physically feeble, too sensitive, prone to hysteria, too illogical, or not skilled enough to serve as doctors and army officers. Dr Agnes Bennett, the first woman to gain a Bachelor of Science degree and with first-class honours from Sydney University, was rebuffed by the AIF's recruiting officer and told to go home and knit. 
She didn't. She left for England instead and served as an officer and doctor. Ambulance driver Olive King dug into her pockets and bought her own ambulance. It was in this social milieu that Pearl and her AANS contemporaries set off, paying for their voyages over. Up against Australian military strictures and stereotypes, rubbing against British officers' classism and disparagement of the Antipodes, poised before new horizons and the heady excitement of uncarved roles. Pearl's life now pivoted between adventure, duty, and the great unknown. They, um, they didn't quite know what they were getting themselves into. The Boer War was quite different. Um, they were never as close to the line as they ended up being in, in the First World War. But um, they knew there'd be conflict um, and nurses, immense numbers of nurses volunteered um, for the First World War and that the outbreak of war. Um, the Australian Army Nursing Service was just, had just been formed, had just been organised and they were ready to accept nurses for service um, in the various theatres overseas. But they were going to go as Australian sisters and they were going to establish Australian hospitals for these nurses. So it was much better organised. But I still think there was a great degree of um, a feeling of adventure among these nurses, but very much a sense of duty. Our boys are going into conflict and we need Australian nurses to look after our Australian boys. We should be there with them. By day and by night, trainloads of injured soldiers arrived. In between arrivals, Pearl was able to partake in some lightness. She enjoyed an active social life. They were tourists, like all the other um, members of the AIF before the conflict started, who were known as six bob a day tourists. The nurses also went out to see the, the pyramids, the Sphinx, um, they had rides on camels. In a postcard home, we see that Pearl liked Chalbra Infectious Diseases Hospital. It was smaller and much better equipped than the first Australian General Hospital at Heliopolis. From August to January 1916, she nursed soldiers who had contracted typhoid, dysentery, mumps and measles in the Dardanelles. There was a very strong bond between Australian nurses and their Australian boys, as they called them. Australian nursing had its own particular flavour. It was all hands to the pump. All nurses had to be trained, extremely well trained, so they'd all gone to big hospitals to, to learn to actually do their nursing studies. But they were women who had grown up on farms, on properties, um, not all of them, there were a lot of girls from the towns as well and from the cities, but um, I think perhaps the fact that Australia was more of a, a rural society at that time than perhaps um, England was, meant that these nurses were very hands-on and they were trained to be hands-on, they were trained to do everything. Um, many of them had more experience perhaps in theatre or less experience in theatre, many had done A&E, accident emergency, that sort of thing, but they were, they were taught the lot. So when they went into a hospital and matron said this is what you'll be doing, that's what they did. It wasn't, but I haven't done that before, I haven't worked in this area before. There was none of that, it was just this is what we're doing. On the island of Lemnos, AANS nurses had shown exceptional levels of resourcefulness in the face of extreme privation and makeshift hospital tents. Initially, there were to be no Australian nurses sent. And the, the women nursing in major hospitals said, no, Australian soldiers will be nursed by Australian nurses, and that's not negotiable. And they more or less forced themselves on a reluctant army. And that had consequences because when they got to Lemnos, which is where they mostly served during the Gallipoli campaign, um, they were treated dreadfully, dreadfully. Um, I was recently there, I hadn't been to Lemnos before, and this was in November, so it was bleak and cold and very windy. Lemnos is always windy. They only started building proper accommodation for the hospital and the nurses in October 1915. In other words, everybody was in, under canvas in tents even as the weather worsened and so on. The hospital was, was all tented, the nurses' accommodation was all tented, and the nurses ate dreadfully. They're, they're the, we, we, have, we know what they were given to eat because a lot of nurses kept diaries, as, as you would know. And uh, we have those diaries, 
And yet we know that the high ups, you know, the commanders, were eating royally. And, and one nurse actually writes about being invited to the officer's mess one night. And she couldn't believe what they were eating, whereas the nurses were eating tinned muck. The tents were often blown down and they had to make do with what they had. In the end, they, they built little kiln ovens, earthenware ovens, where they could actually brew up a little um, Dixie full of, of tea or something for the boys. But they talked in the early stages of using um, the little Dixie, which is the little pan they use for their tea and for their meals, and they put salt water in it and try to boil off as much of the salt as they can or try to desalinate. Then they'd use that for bathing the wounds, wash it out a bit, and then they'd be served dinner in the same thing. They just did not have enough utensils. So it was... Mu it was u using what they have around them to, to maximum extent and, and they made use of absolutely everything they could get their hands on. And they continued to do that after, when they came back from the war, as Pearl Corkill did. Every piece of paper was precious. Oh, I can use that. It's an extra little bit of twine. I can use that. Here's a button from somewhere. I can use that. And that was their mentality. It was make, do and mend. After nine months of service in Egypt, Sister Corkill would step up from the sidelines inventing new ways of making do with her nursing peers. Here they would pioneer radical new roles for nursing and military medicine. Dispatched towards the perilous oceans and skies of Europe, cast now towards the trenches and fields of France, the place of Australian nurses at the front line of battle would never be quibbled about again. Arriving at Marseille in March 1916, Sister Corkill boarded the longest ever train to cross France, its laden wagons snaking slowly towards the second British General Hospital in Le Havre. But it wasn't just Pearl who had been transferred. The entire General Hospital had been loaded on board as the AIF advanced towards the war's most grievous theatre of conflict on the Western Front. All on board must have wondered if they would ever arrive. There were no toilets, there was little food and a severe shortage of water. For two nights and three days, they travelled. A small newspaper article when she was going up to one of the clearing stations, they were on a hospital train, it was one of the longest trains, and there was no water, and they just had to wash with eau de cologne, so they said. One of the, I could just imagine, and they wouldn't have had any equipment much and, yeah, nothing. So besides the poor soldiers, the doctors and the medical staff would have had a horrific time. While nursing in hospitals like the Heliopolis Palace Hotel had been difficult, nursing in unusual circumstances was now fraught with danger for patients and nurses alike. Later in life, Pearl, still straight back and amazingly upright, spoke candidly about the impact of managing casualties on hospital trains. We went to Rouen to meet a New Zealand boy that I had known. He was on a hospital train heading for a channel port. They didn't have the proper facilities to care for him and it seems they just bled to death. Things like that would happen. There was just not enough equipment, and you couldn't get at them on the trains. The upper berths were hard for the nurses to manage. So not much, uh, wouldn't have been much joy, but they just got, on with the, just got on with the job. When Pearl finally disembarked at Le Havre, she had gone, in her own words, from the heat of Egypt to the cold of France. Any notion of nurses' place at the periphery had cracked and fallen away. As the number of casualties escalated, Australian nursing took on ranks, becoming more military in structure. Nurses became deeply engaged in hands-on intensive care, their expertise expanding. They assisted with operations and gave anaesthetics. Yet Sister Corkill and other Australian nurses found time to extend moral and material support to AIF soldiers. This is indicative of the tremendous bond between the Australian nurse and her patient. Um, a lot of them wrote home about the fact that the boys have done their bit and they felt a duty to make sure that these boys survived or that they could, could do something for them. They really felt obliged to do something for them and they wanted to. And they built a bond between 
these men by giving them every little comfort they could. And there was precious little. But the nurses did have, they were paid, they did have small allowances, and they'd often go shopping, and well, as much as you can go shopping on the front, they'd often find someone who would supply them little bits from here and there. The Red Cross was very good because it could access chocolates and things. They'd raid a field nearby sometimes and grab a few turnips or whatever they could find. And they'd try to supplement the diets of these men. Um, Christmas time, they'd try to find cigarettes and matches because these chaps, that was a real comfort to them to be able to sit and have a cigarette with a friend but anything they could do anything extra they felt made a huge difference. Serving at the first Australian General Hospital at Rouen the scale and proximity of the conflict was immediately apparent to Sister Corkill. Hospital tents at the Somme were often little more than walking distance from the trenches and the bloody fields of combat. Casualty clearing stations were just seven miles from the fighting it was into these shadowy and shifting danger lands that nurses risked their lives willingly. Casualty clearing stations were also very, very dangerous places because being close to the front line, they were close to military um, facilities, such as, well, perhaps not ammunition dumps, but, but other military places such as headquarters, um, logistic hubs and that sort of thing. Well, people need to remember and recognise that nurses were under fire and nurses were killed. Um, uh, if you were at a casualty clearing station, you could be in significant danger. Obviously, if you were at a general hospital, uh, the danger was much less, uh, unless the Germans made a huge breakthrough, which they didn't do. But if you were closer to the front line at a, at a casualty clearing station, uh, you could be at great risk. Most injuries and wound infections had not been seen by civilian doctors or nurses prior to World War I. The conflict predated treatments for tetanus and gangrene. Penicillin had not yet been discovered. Disinfectants were largely inadequate and used only in limited amounts. Where machine gun fire didn't kill or amputate outright, it drilled bits of uniform and mud into wounds bored into soldiers' abdomens and internal organs. Gas casualties required hours of labour-intensive sluicing and nursing. From the very front line, a, a man was progressed through the system. And the casualty clearing station is about the third step in that, in that line. So he's rescued by stretcher bearers, which will of course, who will of course be male, and then he goes first to an advanced dressing station and is diagnosed and then is sent to a casualty clearing area. And that's where the female nurses first encountered. Uh, Australian wounded and so you can see that's quite close to the front and a stray shell or shelling which could happen uh, was very dangerous. Triage as we know it today was turned on its head. Um, the triage system was particularly pertinent to those nurses in the casualty clearing stations uh, when a whole lot of wounded came in um, and they often came in waves of a hundred um, they would have to determine which, of course, triage is all about, which one do you look after first. Now in Australia, you take the most seriously injured and you look after that, that poor fellow first and then you work your way down. The lightly wounded can wait a little bit longer. This was completely different. What they looked at in terms of triage at a casualty clearing station was which man is going to survive. He's got a pulse, right, take him to, be, to the operating theatre. This one here asked for a cigarette, definitely, he'll be fine. But anyone who they thought was really on his last legs, they would often give a shot of morphia to to ease his pain and then they would put them in, in what was called the moribund ward, which was really the ward for the dying. And they would look after them as best they could, make them easy, but they were not expected to recover. Besides the poor soldiers, the doctors and the medical staff would have had a horrific time trying to, and they were queued up, just you know, waiting to be operated on or whatever. So it must have been absolutely horrific. Um, so not much, uh, wouldn't have been much joy, but they just got, on with the, just got on with the job and probably worked incredible hours and days and, yeah, and probably could never see the light at the end of the tunnel. To steal her nerves and pass time as she waited for stretcher loads of casualties to arrive, Sister Corkill took French linen and embroidered the most delicate supper cloth. Elegant yet fragile reminders, perhaps, of the comforts of home, of order and the soothing everyday rhythms of domestic life. A matron gave Pearl a vase made from an artillery shell. Souvenirs, the beauty of a dish from Rouen, belie the turmoil and the shattering and destruction of human life at the front line. 
Adept at packing her bags at short notice, Pearl travelled between Rouen and Abbeville as German bombing raids escalated. On the 23rd of August, near Abbeville, at the 38th British Clearing Station, it was Pearl who was in charge on night duty. There was a German plane that used to come over every night to bomb the nearby railway line. This night he came right over us and we could all see him coming. And we said, we're going to get it. We all knew we were still all standing out watching and he dropped three bombs. One went quite close to the kitchen. Two or three boys were going out in the morning. One was being sent back to England and he had his clothes already packed on a locker alongside of him as he had to go out at about 6 a.m. And the bomb burst and blessed if a piece of it didn't come in and hit him in the forehead as he lay in bed and killed him. Sister Pearl Corkill kept a cool head. She refused to take cover and continued to tend to her patients without any regard for her own safety. For her courage and devotion under fire, Sister Corkill was awarded the Military Medal, the civilian equivalent to the Victoria Cross. And of course there were um, um, eight military medals awarded, seven of which were awarded to nurses in casualty clearing stations, including to Pearl Corkhill. Transferred to the first Australian Auxiliary Hospital in Harefield, London, tending to soldiers with injuries and amputations and facing uncertain futures back in Australia, Sister Pearl returned home in March 1919. She nursed at Randwick Military Hospital for four years and never forgot the bonds forged by war. It is only in recent years that these so-called other Anzacs have begun to receive just a little of the recognition and acknowledgement they deserve. They had every right to be considered brave and, and heroic. An army can't work with frontline soldiers only. Um, how could men be encouraged to fight if they thought the hospitals to which they would go were not adequately and properly staffed? So there's no other Anzacs or the frontline troops are the only ones that count. It is a united effort and every single person in the first AIF, or 320,000 of them overseas, had a vital part to play in the overall scheme of things. Like many World War I nurses, Pearl would blend back into civilian life, nursing privately in Australia and overseas. From 1951 to 1961, Sister Corkill was senior sister at Bega Hospital, highly regarded for her professionalism and dedication. In 1975, Pearl donated her father's collection of glass plate negatives to the National Library of Australia, offering up her Tilbury heritage to the nation. She was fortunate to live in good health until a late age, riding the lead at Cooma Show in her late 80s. An engagement ring, which Pearl never took off, and a photograph and a letter, always kept close, leave a little mystery to this day. Sister Pearl Corkill died aged 98 on the 4th of December 1985, self-resourceful until the end. Some say her suitcase was packed, her clothes folded neatly the night before she died. Sister Corkill is buried at Naruma, close to her brother Norman's resting place. A plaque for Pearl lies on her mother's grave, close to her father's and sister's graves at Tilba Tilba District Cemetery. Under the solid, watchful presence of Gulaga and part of the indomitable fabric of Australian nursing. Sister Corkill's story lies forever tied to the Tilba she and her father loved. Pearl's unassuming bravery, her implacable dedication and calm, her grace and grit and pioneering spirit against treacherous odds are forever bound to the story of the Australian Army Nursing Service. A chapter truly deserving of rich illumination, as this Anzac centenary shines a light 
onto a number of Anzac stories left out on the historical margins for too long. There's a wonderful story about her um, in the, one of the casualty clearing stations where a very, very um, wounded soldier comes in and she was moving him, as you did, you know, from one stretch to a bed or something like that. You know, he was very heavy on one side and she thought, oh, something in his pocket, I'll just shift it. And um, so she dug a hand into the uniform and pulled out three Mills bombs and she wrote about it and she said, live, of course. <laughs> so they did have to cope with all sorts of things. <laughs>